welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Camel, and we just had, like 30 minutes ago, an interview with Todd Howard, a brand new interview with Todd Howard that went for about 20 minutes. It was performed during an IGN live stream, which is actually still going, but I had to stop watching and uh, make a video about this before heading to bed because it's currently 6.30 a.m. Todd Howard touches on a few things. Not tons of stuff was revealed, but there were definitely a few very interesting things that Todd brought up. I will have a link to the interview you can listen to watch in full down in the description when they actually upload it because again the live stream it was on is actually still going but for now let's get into the interview we're not going to listen to all of it but all the key points i'll show you and we'll talk about it as well, well i'm always excited when nothing leaks so that's usually where i start <laughs> um uh, no comment <laughs> We do a lot of procedural generation, but I would I would keep in mind that we've always done that. And a planet by itself, if you think about it, is sort of in a game concept. Just one planet is infinitely big if you're going to do it in some realistic fashion. So once you're dealing with scale like that and procedural systems, the difference between, say, one planet and a hundred planets or a thousand planets, it's actually not that big of a leap, if that makes sense, yeah. once you have good systems working for that. So here Todd addresses straight away one of the things I was most curious about is like the thing that I was most excited about and the thing I'm most worried about as well. Talks about the scale of everything. Now you can have a thousand planets, a million planets, but depending on how big those planets are, that's what really matters. And here, Todd says that the planets in game are real life scale. That, to me, is absolutely insane. For better or for worse, that is crazy. He also mentions that they use a lot of procedural generation, but that is something that they've always done. And I'm sure it's to no one's surprise that in a game with a thousand planets, where each planet is again, real life scale, yeah, of course you have to use procedural generation. That's, that's not that shocking. Now, I'm certain that these statements are going to raise some eyebrows and some concerns. But to kind of counteract those concerns, Todd also says, But I should also add that we have done more handcrafting in this game, like content-wise, than any game we've done. We're over 200,000 lines of dialogue. So we still do a lot of handcrafting. And if people just want to do like what they're used to in our games, you're going to see what you'd kind of expect from us. But then you have this whole other part of, well, I'm just going to wander this planet and it's going to provide some gameplay and some random content and those kind of things. It has more handcrafted content than they've ever done for any game that they have created in the past. So what are we like in BGS games? The handcrafted stuff. So in terms of that content, we're getting more than we've ever had before. And then on top of that, as a bonus, we're getting a thousand real life scale planets that I think are going to be really empty and kind of boring to hang around in. But again, if you think about it, that's just a bonus thing on top of their normal handcrafted content. I won't go super into it here, but there's a link above to a video that I just posted in which I explain my planets acting as dungeons theory for Starfield. And I'd love you to listen to that as it might help you understand my lack of worry when it comes to you know, a real life-size planet that's basically got nothing on it. You know, there are a lot of ice balls in space. So that was one of our big design considerations on this game is what's fun about an ice ball? It's okay sometimes if ice balls aren't, you know, the, it is what it is. You want to go land on that weird planet, and check it out and build an outpost and live your life there and watch the sunset because you like the view of the moons there. Like we go for it. We love that stuff interesting here todd says you know some of the planets the moons aren't interesting they're literally not because it's based in our reality they're going for a realistic space thing and he says what's interesting about a big ball of ice in space and then he also just goes well nothing really and building off my planet equals dungeons theory from before these ice ball planets that have nothing on them they're gonna have resources on them and in my mind an ice ball planet basically just acts like you know an ebony mine in skyrim there's no quest there, there's not really any NPCs there, but you can go into that dungeon and get some resources. I think that's how these planets are going to act. It's basically a mine. You go to the planet, mine some stuff, get off the planet. But it's not just dogfighting, like the ship stuff includes, you see it in the video, you can dock with other ships, you can disable them, 
You can dock, you can board it. There's actually some quests that involve that. Um, you can steal the ship. There's dialogue in space. There's star stations you can visit. There's smuggling. There's, pi- it's, you know, all the things that we would want. It's a good chunk of, of gameplay that we think is really fun when it comes to playing this type of sci-fi game. Now, Todd also talks about space combat. There's nothing too new here, although he does mention some of the kind of gameplay mechanics to do with space and spaceships, like boarding other ships, disabling other ships, docking other ships. You can steal ships, there's quests in space, there's dialogue in space, I guess that's over comms, space stations, there's pirates, there's smuggling, and they're just the ones he lists. So I think uh, being in a spaceship in space is going to be more dynamic than just shooting stuff and traveling between stars. In short, yes, you can roleplay as Han Solo. Think of it like class, kind of, it's a start. Right. To hear your starting skills. There is some dialogue that works into that choice um, and some other options in the game based on what you picked. So we do have some really nice role-playing systems for you know some other options in terms of dialogue and crafting, being able to manipulate people, those kind of things, leadership that I think are pretty interesting when it comes to the content we have. Now this is kind of cool and interesting. Todd says depending on the background that you choose for your character, there is some dialogue and uh, options throughout the game that will depend on your character's starting background. And he also likens the uh, character background to the class system in say the Elder Scrolls games, where you start the game and it says, pick your class, barbarian, knight, you know, spell sword, sorcerer, rogue, whatever that is. And depending on what class you chose in those games, you would get boost to certain skills. You know, a rogue would have, you know, short blade, sneak, security, pickpocket, lockpicking, that kind of stuff. So these character backgrounds are literally the same thing. They're class systems. But it's nice to hear there are some dynamic options and interactions in the game to do with your character's starting background. So this system does go beyond just, you know, you start with three skills. And New Atlantis is easily the biggest city in the game and the biggest city we've ever built, um, kind of the capital uh here in the game and it has all the services you would expect and you can work on your ship there the the factions touch that but that's also the headquarters for constellation so this is cool todd says that new atlantis the capital city the main city in the game is the biggest city in the game but also the biggest city by far that they've ever built in any game Thinking back, I'm trying to think what would have been the biggest city previously, and I probably the Imperial City in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, of course. So if this goes beyond that, and it's easily bigger than that, then New Atlantis is going to be a pretty, pretty dang big city. And that's really where the main quest goes through that group. So that's that's where they're headquartered. Constellation is trying to, f- you know, they're still exploring and figuring out the mysteries of the universe, and they also look for you know, old earth artifacts. You'll see that in some of the stuff we hint at exploration. And then they've uncovered some of these artifacts. They don't know their origin. And that's the quest you kind of start on. So here Todd mentions that Constellation, the faction that we joined uh, based around the main quest, actually search for old earth artifacts. I thought that was interesting. I don't think that's something we've actually been told before. And along with this, of course, we're going to be searching for these ancient unknown origin artifacts as well. But this one's ending up a little bit longer, um, and we may tune that some still. And it's more quests, so it might be 20% more than our previous ones. But if our previous ones, if we aimed for, let's say, 25-hour main quest, this one might be in the 30s, maybe maybe 40 just for the main quest. Here we learn that the main quest in Starfield is going to be a little bit about 20% longer than the main quest lines in their previous games, which were sitting at about 25 hours of straight gameplay time if you just played through just the main quest. Todd mentions it's going to be around 30 to 40 hours. So it would seem that Starfield's main quest has uh, increased in scale, just like the game has from their previous games. Certainly, we're going to be doing extra content for this game, and we love our modding community. We actually think this game for our modding community is going to be a dream because there's so much they could do. Uh, Now, Todd says they're definitely going to be doing extra content for this game. Obviously, I think they're going to do DLC, but I think he didn't say DLC specifically because they're going to incorporate Creation Club stuff. That's not super surprising, but I'm not the biggest fan of Creation Club content. It's not so much the content I have trouble with, it's the pricing point of the content in Creation Club. I think they should do something like a year pass or like you pay $30 once and you get access to everything in the Creation Club to ever or something like that. But when it's things like, hey, 
This creation club thing adds a weapon and it costs $8. It's like, no, no. But that's my personal gripe. Uh, so the takeaway from that is that yes, they are of course going to be doing extra content for Starfield, whether that be in the form of DLC or something else. He also mentions that Starfield, he thinks, is a dream for the modding community. And I mean, of course it is, dude. You got all these empty ice planets. Someone's gonna build a city on one of those planets, bro. There's gonna be a Thomas the Tank Engine spaceship and a lightsaber mod within the first 24 hours of the game's release. I guarantee it. And here is, ironically, probably the biggest reveal of this interview, something not related to Starfield. But together thing you said, yes, our, you know, Elder Scrolls 6 is is in pre-production and you know we're going to be doing fallout 5 after that so our slate's pretty pretty full going forward for a while we have some other projects that we we look at um from time to time as well but they do they do take a while i wish they came out faster I really do we're trying as hard as we can but we want them to just be as best as they could be for everybody so there we get, yes, that the Elder Scrolls 6 is in pre-production, something we already knew about, I think from last year even. And then he drops the onion. Todd confirms that Fallout 5 will be coming after the Elder Scrolls 6. Now, this is something that I thought was obviously going to be happening anyway, but this is the first time uh, anyone from Bethesda has uttered the words Fallout 5, let alone confirmed the fact that yes, Fallout 5 is coming after the Elder Scrolls 6. It's nice to know, it's nice to have it confirmed. Uh, it's not that surprising, of course. And also, of course, Fallout 5 is so far away. Starfield's coming out next year, then there's probably going to be a four-year window between that and Elder Scrolls 6, which would make Elder Scrolls 6 2027. So Fallout 5 will probably have another four-year window, which would make it 2031. So there's a little nugget of information to pop your <laughs> Fallout 5 excitement balloon there. Sorry, I know, I hate it as much as you do. Todd also says that he wishes their games could come out faster, but unfortunately he doesn't address the fact that they're doing something to make games come out faster. I was really hoping that he would say, oh, we're going to expand the studio, you know, three times the staff or something. We can bring out games, you know, we can bring, bring down the game gap window from four years to three years. That'd be something. But unfortunately he mentions no such thing, so... I think we can play it pretty safe, assuming there's going to be a, a four year window between BGS games. Interestingly, he also notes that there are some other things that BGS looks at from time to time. Um, I think this is probably in reference to say mobile games like the Elder Scrolls Blades or Fallout Shelter or something like that. I don't think they're going to be working on any giant projects that will truly get in the way of Starfield, Elder Scrolls 6 and Fallout 5. And that basically concludes all the relevant, interesting information that was revealed in that interview with Todd Howard that IGN did. For me, the two biggest takeaways were that Fallout 5 is confirmed, but the biggest one by far, and quite literally the biggest one by far, is the fact that the planets are real life scale. That is crazy. At this point, I don't even know what to think about that. That is just, what? <laughs> Like, holy shit. Anyway, I'd love to know your thoughts on all of this stuff. I love reading your comments about these nuggets of information to do with Starfield. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next video. I've been Camel, and I'll see you there soon.